What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest episode 223 at block height 633,419, Saturday, June 6th. So what is shaking today, Janine? Um, I think, uh, think for once both of us are going to have to restrain um, some irritation today. Yeah, I don't know if it's just because I spent more time today looking for stories to cover and so I just happened to come across more stupid or if more stupid just happened to happen more today. But either way, there is a lot of interesting stuff that has happened today and in the past week <laughs> to make me angry. <laughs> And as we know, anger on the internet sells. Enragement is engagement. Mm hmm So I guess, uh, yeah, today you, you want to just dive right into it? Yeah, I mean, I think the first story is actually not very enraging, thankfully. Mm hmm Although I still have things to go, what the hell. Uh, <laughs> so... Bitcoin Core 0.20 was released on June 3rd, and uh, this is shipping a brand new network feature um, to try to kind of spread the, the connections that your node is making across the entire internet. Um, so you can kind of look at the internet in terms of a network of networks um, as broken up into zones called autonomous systems. And pretty much what this new feature does, um, we covered it. Again, I, I am horrible at thinking of past episode names compared to Janine um, a while ago. But it is shipped in 0.20 and can be enabled with a flag. And pretty much the idea here is to track the autonomous system numbers of different IP addresses of uh, peers to your node and trying to make sure that there is a good balance of um, nodes across as many different autonomous systems as possible um, to attempt to mitigate the, the types of eclipse or, or attacks where your node is surrounded and then fed false information while being prevented from connecting to the single honest node that's necessary in order to call shenanigans on you being attacked. And so th this is a pretty big um, network change. And you know, anybody who wants to, uh, you can go ahead and flip this on when you download the node. Um, but for the most part, it's, um, a decent amount of RPC changes and some small things. Um, for instance, the wallet is now finally using BEC32 uh, through the RPC as default. Um, and this is this is my come on guys. Um, we are halfway there uh, to PSVT support in the GUI. Um, right now, when you load a watch only wallet. Um, you can actually create a transaction and then um, copy it into the, the clipboard to move to an external tool to sign it with. But there is still not GUI support um, for feeding the PSBT back into core uh, for broadcasting. So unless you're comfortable messing around with the command line, um, you'd have to use some other tool for broadcasting. But we're getting there. Um, and then, um, a new RPC, um, is the dump transaction, uh, outset RPC, which is pretty much a serialized snapshot of the entire UTXO set. Um, and there's also, um, kind of a helper script 
um, that can actually generate a snapshot from a specific block height if you need to for any reason. Um, and, you know, honestly, it's mostly just a lot of, uh, you know, low level changes that for most users um, probably aren't going to make much of a difference. But if you are building anything on top of um, core, you know, definitely something to look into. Um, and especially there's been some changes to the output descriptor functionality um, to support multi-sig now as well. So, you know, all in all, um, it's a pretty nice release. Um, although I personally, uh, give me full PSBT exposure in core. Give me full PSBT exposure in core. That's my, my sarcastic protest chant. Um, that's probably going to get 10,000 people pissed off. All right. Um, yeah. But, you know, if you really want to dive through the all the, the tiny little low-level changes, uh, the link to the, the release notes is in the, the show notes. So uh, have fun. And I think that's about as much delaying as I can do to both of us getting uh, agitated, Janine. Yep. Uh, so in the last episode, 222, I talked about how Hacking Team had been declared dead by its rather notorious CEO recently. And woo, I did not expect that that thing about uh, their software living on, um, as we mentioned, would be proven right so quickly. Because yesterday, June 5th, the block reported exclusively that Coinbase wants to sell blockchain analysis software to the IRS and DEA a year after its neutrino acquisition. For anyone who doesn't know, IRS is Internal Revenue Service and the DEA is the Drug Enforcement Administration, which basically spearheads the war on drugs. Uh, more on that later. But they say in the article, records obtained by the block show that the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and the Internet, Re Internet the Internal Revenue Service intends to buy licenses from Coinbase for an analytics platform called Coinbase Analytics. Ooh, what is that? Documents related uh, the purchases by the IRS and DEA were published in April and May, respectively. Uh, notably, the IRS document draws a connection between Coinbase Analytics and Neutrino, an intelligence agency that Coinbase controversially purchased in 2019. Hello, delete Coinbase. Uh, the acquisition drew controversy due to its founder's involvement in the Italian spyware firm hacking team. Involvement is putting it lightly, by the way. They were almost entirely people from the upper management of Hacking Team. They were basically co-founders in the case of at least two of them. So yeah, involvement is putting it lightly. Anyway, uh, Coinbase ultimately said that it would part ways with team members associated with Hacking Team. We don't know if that actually happened, but who knows? Anyway, public records indicate that Coinbase has not uh, been officially granted the awards and the company does not appear in queries submitted to usaspending.gov, a directory for government contract awards. According to this database page, Coinbase's registration to offer products and services to the U.S. government became active on April 28th with, with an expiration date of April 13th, 2021. The uh, DEA document in particular, almost half of which uh, is very nicely redacted, states... Coinbase Analytics, a cryptocurrency intelligence tool, provides investigators with identity attribution and de-anonymities, uh, I think that's a misspelling, it should be de-anonymizes, virtual currency addresses domestically and internationally. CA is known for its accuracy of attribution, which includes some of the most conservative heuristics based in commercial blockchain tracing tools. This is critical in avoiding false positives uh, during target identification. Target identification, very interesting choice of words. Um, so you may have seen that Brian Armstrong, uh, Armstrong tweeted this uh, very long thread uh, a few days ago, I think it might have even been yesterday, about how he's been affected by the social unrest lately in the United States. And he wanted you to know that he thinks that Black Lives Matter. And so 
My question would be for him regarding this, how can you genuinely claim to care about police brutality against people of color while at the same time helping and taking money from the agency that has ruined so many of their lives? How many black lives and families were destroyed through the DEA's multi-decade war on drugs? How many nonviolent offenders, colored or otherwise, will be thrown in prison because Coinbase is going to help de-anonymize them if they do get this contract? And I'm not claiming that taking money from and helping an agency with a long record of negatively impacting black people in particular makes Brian or Coinbase racist, but it certainly is hypocritical. Um, also, DEA policies don't just impact drug users, as I had some people try to explain to me. Um, and I say that as a person who has never done any recreational drugs whatsoever of any sort. I don't even take over-the-counter medication when I'm sick. I don't drink alcohol. I am one of the most restricted and uptight people you'll probably find on the face of this earth, as Shinobi well knows, when it comes to me personally consuming drugs. But at the end of the day, I will fight for your right to peacefully consume whatever plant you want and keep you out of prison for doing so, because the apparatus of state violence and surveillance built for the drug war corrodes whole families, whole communities, and whole generations, sometimes permanently. Predictably, uh, just like last time with the delete Coinbase debacle, Coinbase is trying to stay absolutely freaking quiet about this because they are cowards who can't own up to their mistakes if they even see that this is a mistake. Um, and what we should have learned over the years is that they will keep making mistakes like this, getting worse and worse, and they will basically only stop if enough people make a decision to opt out, which is why I keep telling people why it's called Delete Coinbase. At the end of the day, if you've doxed yourself to Coinbase, um, the best you'll get is... Uh, They'll have to keep some of your data for, I think the, the waiting period is like six years. They can't actually delete all of the data, even if you request it. So you're still going to be at risk. It's not about you. It's about opting out of a system that wants to basically turn Bitcoin, turn this ecosystem into a financial panopticon that is the opposite of everything that we claim to stand for. Yeah, but honestly, I can't uh, can't say that I'm really that shocked. Um, you know, what the hell else were they going to do with it? And really, it's like companies like Coinbase don't give a shit about Bitcoin. They don't give a shit about the reasons that Bitcoin was created. They just don't give a shit. And, you know, I think uh, I, I forget the name of it, but something that Rusty Russell from Blockstream wrote um, hits the nail on the head that's been circulating around for the past few days. It's these businesses that are exchanges listing all of these shit coins and other coins in this space. They are not allies of Bitcoin. They have no interest in Bitcoin's future success. They don't give a shit about anything except making you buy as many different shit coins and crap scams as they possibly can because they milk money out of you then. They get trading fees. They don't give a shit about Bitcoin. They don't give a shit about whether this actually succeeds in the ends in terms of incentivizing massive societal change. They don't fucking care. And anybody at this point who thinks they do, you are a deluded moron. Anybody who does realize that this is what's going on, stop recommending these businesses to people you know. Stop sending them to them. Send them somewhere else. Send them somewhere that is actually just trying to facilitate them getting Bitcoin and that's their business model. Because that is actually properly in or aligned with this ecosystem. Businesses like Coinbase, they aren't and they never will be. Yeah. And then, you know, it's like, yeah, the, the entire um, virtue signaling with the protests going on right now. And then this comes out like, yeah, uh, you, you nailed it with that, Janine. Like, it, he's a fucking hypocrite. Uh, so the reason I've been particularly silent is that the next story is supposed to be about the Europol Wasabi wallet report that has been, uh, well, apparently it wasn't supposed to be seen, even though it wasn't actually, at the end of the day, that revealing. 
but um, it was originally published by Coinbase, and they used a stupid little app called Scribd, which is the most annoying document sharing service that I have ever had to experience because it's so hard to actually get the raw document when you're you going through Scribd. You ha it takes a number of clicks. So obviously, uh, I took a number of uh, different ways of trying to get the document, one of which was just literally getting the links directly to the images and putting those in an archive. And I don't know about you, but I'm trying to access that right now on archive.org, and it is saying 503. So I have to check for a moment to see whether the frickin' Internet Archive submitted to a takedown request for this piece of shit. Well, if they did, then we will just circulate local copies somewhere else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a local copy. Like, screw these people, but I'm just going to see if it's actually available online still. But if I don't, I will be back in a moment. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, the Internet Archive isn't working. I don't know if it's a problem on my end or their end, but that is garbage. Um, you should just know that they have been attempting to take it down from various file sharing services. I don't know if that's the case for Internet Archive, but seriously, I local copy. Screw you people who think you can get away with this. Um, anyway, there was a very interesting report that was released, um, well, found recently from Europol, specifically the European Cybercrime Center. Um, and apparently they do a, uh, it's labeled as for law enforcement only, ooh, scary. Um, they do apparently a series called Cyberbits that seems to be some kind of internal knowledge base. Um, and that, yeah, that is one of the links posted in the chat. I don't know if it still works because it might have been taken down already, but you can try it. Um, and basically, it's just a document that talks about what Wasabi Wallet is and actually how to use it, um, apparently, to familiarize law enforcement who may need to know how it works. Um, but the most interesting thing is at the end of the document, where uh, basically it, it has these kinds of frequently asked questions or important questions, and one of them is like, uh, something I'll, I'll get it really quick because I don't have it on screen. All right, I'm getting annoyed because I can't find it in the document because the document is made of images and it's hard to search terms and images. But there was a part where um, basically the report included a question about like, how effective is this against mixing coins? And their response was basically, it does pretty well and this is going to be a problem, um, which I find pretty hilarious. And I mean, in general, I find it hilarious that basically this document contained nothing sensitive except for the fact that, <laughs> um, that they're interested in Wasabi and they're looking at it, but I don't think anyone actually believed that they haven't been interested in it for a while. So it's kind of strange how censorous uh, they've been about trying to scrub this document from not only the Coindesk article, but file sharing websites, because apparently they maybe just don't want people to know that they actually think wasabi works apparently mm -hmm. and it just goes to show that you know if a, a mixing protocol is done properly like it is going to obscure the transaction graph of shit um and pretty much the only way around that is fatal flaws in that design or a user screwing up i mean point blank like those are the only instances I have seen to date of these mixers being de-anonymized. It's users screwing up after the fact and undoing the privacy gains that the mixer gave them. Yeah, and definitely uh, I would agree with the whole decentralized internet archive, or at least, uh, as Shinobi has repeated a number of times, there needs to be a marriage between the internet archive and, um, and open timestamps. Um, but 
until that happens, if they continue to try to censor this document, which would kind of be hard because by now I'm sure people have tweeted out screenshots and they would have to attack individual users and contact Twitter and stuff. But if they do do that, I will probably just, you know, we can make a video where we read the report. That would be nice. Some uh, Euro post Euro poll story time. Yeah, I don't see why not. But yeah, because if there's one thing that annoys me, it's it's uh, censoring important documents that harm no one by sharing. Mm -hmm. And if they're worried about naive, like same amount coin join implementations, woo wee, coin swaps coming soon. Well, I guess you want to just uh, take us into the next one. Yeah, so the next one is somewhat related. Um, as you know, uh, when Nopar used to be a co-host, he would give us some updates on various chain analysis uh, webinars that would come out and basically report what they said and things they got wrong and things that were interesting. And uh, they, these companies are still doing that. And of course, chain analysis is one of the ones that does it the most. And they recently published a recording of one of their latest webinars, which is advanced um, obfuscation techniques, mixing uh, coin joins, chain hopping, and privacy coins. Um, it's about an hour long, um, just a slide presentation uh, by Nina Hayden and Jakob Illum. Early on in the presentation, they say that there are two reasons for obfuscation of coin histories, privacy and money laundering. They, they do separate the two, which is interesting. Uh, they interesting because they don't usually do that. They just like to imply that everyone who wants privacy is hiding something. Uh, and then they talk about the differences between mixing coin joins, chain hopping, and privacy coins in terms of the technique and how they've been used after various exchange hacks, um, how effective they are. And about 46 minutes in, they display a slide that compares them according to five characteristics, custodial model or not, uh, complexity, risk, um, their, whether it's inherently illicit, and how actively it is used. Um, and something that was noticed in this chart is that the inherently illicit column is crossed off for all three categories, even though the risk category is checked for all of them. So basically, none of these, uh, none of these techniques according to chain analysis, are inherently illicit. Um, and that's interesting because the insinuation that is prevalent through all of their marketing, all of their recommendations to their exchange and law enforcement clients is that for compliance reasons, no one should be accepting coins that use these techniques. They should not accept Bitcoin that's come from coin joins. They should not accept full privacy coins or privacy coins in their shielded form in the case of Zcash. And so I think that is something which will be important to remember going forward when you have to deal with these people, uh, when they you know, uh, tell you that something like chain analysis is indispensable because using privacy features is a marker of criminality. Fuck these companies. There was uh, also quite unrelated, but there was a funny tweet from Naraj who said that... Um, Someone once argued to him that um, that uh, I'm gonna have to get the tweet because I want to quote it correctly. <laughs> All right, I found it. Um, so Naraj tweeted, I think this was yesterday. Uh, once talked to a guy who was arguing that financial surveillance is unconstitutional because the Third Amendment protects him from being forced to quarter in-house compliance people. <laughs> I agree with I agree with that. Third Amendment rights, buddy. No compliance. I remember that. That, that is a pretty funny uh, twist to to what's going on. <laughs> Alrighty. What is next? Oh dear. Is this the is this the one? This is where Shinobi's blood pressure goes through the fucking roof. So Salim Rashid um recently disclosed 
to Ledger, to Shift, to Trezor, but for some reason not CoinKite. A major bug um, as far as signing SegWit transactions uh, with these hardware devices. And pretty much the gist of it boils down to really um, following the BIP143 spec um, and leaving open the, the potential for a very, very targeted attack that could trick you into pretty much dumping a large amount of an output into fees without realizing it. Now, the reason for this is that prior to SegWit, all of these devices would actually take um, the full previous transaction that a UTXO um, going into the one year signing um, was a, an input for and verify all of the details in the previous transaction. Um, most importantly, the amount um, of value in that UTXO before actually signing the device. Now under the, uh, the BIP 143 spec, um, it only passes in the output. And this was done to kind of save uh, a lot of resources, um, you know, because in, in the case of a very large transaction, um, that's a lot of data that the, a very small computing device in a hardware wallet is going to have to load into and validate before signing the transaction. So this was done as a way to speed up um, signing for SegWit. And the issues um, were not thought to be potentially exploitable until Salim realized um, that you could, let's say you have two UTXOs going into a transaction. Um, by actually compromising the computer that your device is plugged into, um, you could play kind of a switcheroo game. Um, where you could throw an error on the hardware wallet and trick it into signing two different versions of each of those inputs in two different transactions um, and lie to the hardware wallet about the actual value of that UTXO. And in this way, when it's signed both, um, you can kind of take one input um, from each of the transactions um, combine that into a valid transaction because the signatures are going to be the same and dump a bunch of your money into a fee. Now, initially, this is kind of like, well, nobody can really exploit this except to burn your money pointlessly um, unless they are also a miner. Um, but Lazy Ninja has kind of pointed out the potential for a ransom attack um, where you could withhold these um, and try to kind of bribe a miner into actually, um, you know, benefiting some way as the attacker. Um, so that is something to be aware of. Although this is, again, you would have to be specifically targeted, your wallet software on your computer compromised. And then you would also see, um, you know, an error on the device and be asked to confirm the transaction again. So that um, is something that everybody out there should immediately seeing from this point on throw a red flag in their head. If your device is asking you to confirm a transaction twice, um, this could potentially be going on. Now with patches coming out, you may ask, well, wouldn't that solve it? Um, and it would. But in the instance of Trezor's patch, um, they are fixing this by actually feeding the entire previous transaction into the hardware wallet to validate this information. Now, um, this breaks a bunch of shit um, that is used to actually bridge the gap between a Trezor device and software wallets out there. Um, it breaks Electrum. Um, so if you upgrade this firmware, your Trezor will not um, be able to work with Electrum until the next version of Electrum is released. Um, as well, anything working off uh, PSBT based systems, HWI, BTC Pay, um, Wasabi are some of the ones out there, um, will also not be able to work with an updated Trezor um, until this is patched on their end. And the issue is that not every device out there has 
or I mean wallet software out there, has the full previous transaction to feed into the Trezor. Um, so there's two things that I am kind of furious about around this issue. Um, one, the fact that Salim pretty much reached out to every major hardware wallet company out there except CoinKite is the most unethical, irresponsible, childish fucking attitude somebody could have presenting themselves in this space as a security researcher attempting to guarantee security for people in this space. Um, that was unbelievably fucking childish, irresponsible, and quite realistically um, now puts a, a whole class of user at risk simply because he did not disclose this issue to a company because of petty personal bullshit. Um, that shit needs to fucking stop in this space because quite frankly, it, it is fucking childish beyond belief. If, if you are not going to actually warn everybody about issues that could affect their coins, fuck you. Because the reality is nobody here loses except the users. Refusing to disclose this to CoinKite, that doesn't hurt CoinKite. That doesn't hurt the people at CoinKite that Salim has issues with. That hurts the users of CoinKite who have nothing to do with the petty bickering bullshit that Salim has gotten in with them in the past. So that needs to fucking stop. And then secondly, Trezor for the second time in the last month or two, just broke compatibility with HWI, with Electrum, the, the most widely used um, wallet software out there, and um, BTC Pay and Wasabi. And their entire attitude about this is, oh, well, um, having had 90 days during which they sat on this disclosure before it was disclosed, 90 days, three fucking months, they did not reach out to any of these projects and actually explain the issue, give a heads up what the problem is, what the compatibility concerns were, so that the software could actually reflect the changes in the hardware and remain compatible in a timely manner. And quite frankly, this is a fucking consistent pattern with this company. And I'm just going to jump right past the, this SegWit issue here, and I'm going to go into the next one. Because guess what? This patch to update um, Trezor for the SegWit um, issues with BIP143, um, yeah, it also breaks CASA, who use a custom derivation path um, in the process of health checking hardware devices that their customers use, um, a way to have it um, sign something and prove access to keys are still there, that the device is still functional. Um, and that is now for some reason in this update restricted. And the derivation paths that any Bitcoin software can use are now artificially restricted to official standards, which completely breaks the entire health check process of CASA. Um, the GitHub issue that was uh, made for this was just instantly closed. And this also probably breaks functionality, although they're still looking into it and haven't confirmed it, with uh, Blockstream Green as well. So frankly, stop using Trezor. I am not only never recommending them again, I am actively recommending nobody use that device anymore. Get a new one, anything else besides that, and stop using devices that constantly break compatibility with software that is under your control, that is private, that actually validates things itself and forces you into, oh, you have to use our centralized web app that completely destroys your privacy um, until the thing we broke gets fixed again. Because that is the most fucking disingenuous horseshit in this space. That company latches on to the meme, the word open source, as nothing but a fucking marketing gimmick. And they don't give a shit about that actual ethos in this space. Because if they did, they would not time and time again break their fucking product for any user who does not use their centralized fucking garbage ass web wallet that completely destroys your privacy. So frankly, fuck Trezor.
Yeah, so, I mean, this, even if we were to assume the best of them and say that they made this update and they just didn't know how broad the effect would be, then that still shows that they are not sufficiently aware of the ecosystem of people and companies that are using their devices and are reliant on them, you know, working. And I just, it's, it's pretty amazing that it didn't cross their minds that they should have maybe contacted the various projects that use them and could be affected by this and say, hey, there's this problem, we're going to fix it, but we're going to make sure that it doesn't break something that you're doing. Um, I mean, you don't have to understand every project in depth. It's just about communication and making sure that you don't do something that throws everyone into a fit for a couple of days because their customers' funds are safe, but they're not able to access them because everything has stopped working together. That is not good. So for anyone who actually does really feel like they want to stop using Trezor, um, just so that you should know, this does not affect, or it has very little risk for the safety of funds themselves. This is purely about various wallets working together, the software wallets working together with the hardware wallet and things like that. Um, and if you're concerned about that and don't want to deal with that anymore, um, obviously there are ways where you can, you know, back up the keys on your treasure. Hopefully you already have a backup. And if you do, you should, or you could migrate that into a different wallet that is compatible. Um, but in case you haven't seen, uh, you probably, <laughs> will encounter some issues with that because wallet compatibility sucks. Um, there's a lot of differences in terms of how wallets implement various standards, if they even put the same standards at all. So I would recommend checking out walletsrecovery.org, which is something that I've worked on with Rodolfo Novak to basically inform people about the different uh, derivation paths for various scripts, the various BIPs that are supported, and some key functionality like PSBT. Um, those are some things you should know when you're trying to import keys into a different wallet that you didn't generate them in. So just keep that in mind if you do do something like that. Don't obviously do it out of fear or from a place of fear or anxiety because that's never a good thing to be doing when you're freaking out. Mm -hmm. And for anybody out there who can't or isn't going to update due to compatibility reasons um, that would be too disruptive to you, um, just remember an error being thrown and you being asked to sign the same transaction twice, um, that's the red alarm stop there and assess the situation. And anybody who has a cold card, um, if you use the SD card to move transactions air gapped, um, you can also attempt to kind of mitigate the concern here by generating the PSBT on one device, signing on the cold card, and then broadcasting it from a second device. And then that way, um, even if you were somehow tricked into signing a malicious transaction, um, they would have to compromise the second device as well um, for you to not realize that checking it before you broadcast it. Alrighty, so are we ready to see what a shady totalitarian government is up to? Always. So, um, the Chinese Communist Party is now beta testing its digital currency um, in four different cities around China um, with the intent to slowly ramp that up into wider use throughout the country. Um, and really, I'm just going to give a quick TLDR. Um, you can go through the, the whole Bloomberg article um, if you really want to. But the gist is, um, they're specifically planning 
on um, using this to push out private um, digital payment rails that are currently massive um, all throughout China and specifically are aware because remember they've been looking at this for five years or more now um, of the potential for a direct um, central bank digital currency like this to start having weird competitive consequences in the economy at large. Um, but they're specifically laying out a plan um, to, at, at the very least, um, on a technological level, um, push for other countries to follow their lead um, as this program expands and inevitably um, want to try to push to the point of challenging the US dollar's supremacy with this digital currency simply because of how easily they could make it accessible um, internationally or how simple it would be to settle things internationally in this currency. Um, and it would give the Chinese Communist Party a direct eye and hand over everything going on with this system. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think at this point, this is actually going to happen. This is not going to just be a meme that fizzles out and they go, oh, well, um, this isn't going to work. Um, they're actually going to do this. And I think that's something that the rest of the world needs to start thinking about and taking seriously. All right. Should we uh, get into the other kinds of scenarios that some people in government envision? Mm -hmm. All right, child punks, uh, gather around. It is time to venture into the wonderful world of Pentagon war games, uh, where they envision various catastrophes and how to respond to them. Uh, I will be reading, word for word, a story uh, from a copy of the Notional Exercise Material for Educational Purposes uh, World Summary Document, from the 2018 Joint Land, Air, and Sea Strategic Special Program, or JLAS, which was attained, uh, obtained by The Intercept. z Bellion. In the mid-2020s, the age demographic known as Generation Z, or Gen Z, began hitting their 30s. Like the millennials who preceded them, Gen Z were characterized as even more comfortable, if not dependent upon, technology in nearly every aspect of their lives. Social scientists frequently characterize Gen Z as having grown up with cell phone and internet usage from a very young age and interacting on social media websites for a significant portion of their socializing. Image and video intensive media are more popular among this group than textual uh, narratives, and many Gen Z self-identify by the social media communities to which they belong. Both the September 11th terrorist attacks and the Great uh, Recession frequently, the Great Recession greatly influenced the attitudes of this generation in the United States and resulted in a feeling of unsettlement and insecurity among Gen Z. Although millennials experienced these events during their coming of age, Gen Z lived through them as part of their childhood, affecting their realism and worldview. Although many Gen Z sought to avoid the financial stresses experienced by their parents, many found themselves stuck with excessive college debt when they discovered employment options did not meet their expectations. Gen Z are often described as seeking independence and opportunity, but also um, are among the least likely to believe there is such a thing as the American dream and that the system is rigged against them. Frequently seeing themselves as agents for social change, they crave fulfillment and excitement in their job to help move the world forward. Despite the technological proficiency they possess, Gen Z act, uh, actually prefer person-to-person -person contact as opposed to online interaction. They describe themselves as being involved in their virtual and physical communities and as having rejected excessive uh, consumerism. In early 2025, a group identifying itself as Zebellion gained traction on the dark web. Zebellion capitalized on the fears and insecurities of Gen Z and called for a global SIR campaign to expose injustice and corruption and to support various causes it deemed beneficial. It appears that Zebellion initially formed in small groups at parks, rallies, protests, and coffee shops, and grew rapidly by promoting an agenda which targets corporations, financial institutions, and political and nonprofit organizations that support, quote, the establishment. 
Recruitment appears focused in large cities via face-to-face contact, providing initial instructions for assessing Zebellion websites. Uh, these websites provide target lists to include data needed to identify uh, them for credit card theft, payloads, and exploits to activists. Zebellion uses social Zebellion uses software programs to route any proceeds into laundering programs that ultimately convert national currencies into Bitcoin and make small, below-the-threshold donations to worthy recipients. And if Zebellion members claim financial need to the member who conducted the attack, Zebellion leadership assures its members that their cyber crimes are ultimately justified. Uh, and untraceable, and that it selects its targets and be- beneficiaries based on secure polling of network delegates. Yes, this was uh, your uh, segment of Pentagon story time. Yay! So they're pretty much trying to describe um, violent groups like Antifa and associate them with Bitcoin. I wonder why they would want to do that. Hmm. I also wonder why this, you know, war game associating those two things dropped recently. I really wonder why. Yes, and it's also uh, quite interesting, the idea not only of in kind of Antifa sounding group of people organizing, Um, based on apparently generational ties. But apparently they think that these people would use Bitcoin as a wealth distribution mechanism, (laughs) which is hilarious because there are a ton of left-leaning people who think that Bitcoin is the opposite of that and think it just is a rich-get-richer scheme. Uh, which is wrong, but it's just hilarious because it's the opposite of what a lot of them actually think. I mean, the the absurdity of this is really like trying to convince people that the Black Panthers and neo-Nazis are the same group. Um, Anybody who has even the slightest idea what either of those things are or what is going on in the world is just going to immediately start cackling with laughter hearing that statement. But yeah, I mean, the Pentagon loves um, war games and also the military loves to just uh, drop things out there at key opportune moments to try and shift public opinion about certain things. So yeah, I wonder Mm -hmm. why this just came out. Yeah, and keep in mind, it was uh, supposedly written or presented in 2018, two years ago. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, I guess uh, next two are just two quick updates. Um, so Electrum Personal Server just dropped a uh, new release um, alongside Bitcoin Core 0.20. Um, and this has actually got a couple substantial behind the hood changes, um, a massive speed up in the startup time and importing of addresses, uh, because the new version is now making use of, uh, descriptor features, um, in the Bitcoin core RPC. And this should especially help, um, in terms of run times, uh, with anybody who's running a node and EPS on something like a raspberry Pi um, without a lot of resources. Um, he's also defaulted the EPS instance, um, to closing the connection with the actual Electrum wallet. If there is any problem, um, communicating between EPS and your Bitcoin core instance. So that way, um, you can actually see that something is going on in a way that's quickly noticeable in the wallet. Um, and he's also increased the default polling intervals. So how often um, EPS asks Bitcoin Core, like, has anything changed with the balances? Um, so that hopefully, um, you know, when you are trying to transact or receive money, there's a little uh, speedier of a user experience and actually seeing balance updates. Um, so yeah, anybody up there who is 
running EPS, um, I would upgrade this, although I will remind that this requires uh, Bitcoin Core 0.20. So if you're going to upgrade EPS, um, you're going to have to upgrade Core as well, or that's going to break. And then anybody out there using a MyNode, um, Unchained Capital, um, guess what? There's a marriage going on here. Um, my node is now supporting and bundled in um, Unchained Capital's Caravan wallet, which, you know, as I was saying uh, an episode or two ago, when looking at the newest release of that, um, they are going a direction that makes me think I might actually start shilling a web browser based wallet sometime soon. Uh, so, yeah, um, that is a pretty awesome thing to have access to that. Um, hooked up to your own full node. And uh, maybe we can see that come as a general feature in Caravan sometime soon. But um, yeah, you know, it's a good week for software updates. And I do also want to quickly note, um, if you follow the, the tweet thread down, um, linked in the show notes for uh, the MyNode release, um, I linked um, Unchained Capital's announcement of this. And if you scroll down, um, there's actually from the end of April, um, a user made um, tool called Cold Card Kitchen to hook uh, Cold Card up to Caravan right now. Um, and I can't believe I actually missed that. But um, until you know, um, Unchained Capital actually brings in Cold Card support in Caravan itself, um, anybody out there who wants to use the two things together uh, can look at this Cold Card Kitchen application. So uh, yeah, you know, Lots of new software dropping. Go out and play with it. Speaking of things that are dropping. Yep, back to raising blood pressure time. Uh, so for those of you who have been listening to Block Digest for a few years, you may know by now that I don't have a particularly positive opinion of Brave. I did back in 2016 and early 2017 when, well, it was, uh, there was less information about it and it wasn't quite as established and things hadn't happened yet. But if you aren't aware of why I don't have a particularly positive opinion, you can check out episode 65 for first and foremost, that is the main one that will give you a lot of information, but also 59, 123, 130, 149, 152, and 174. I'll talk about Brave. Um, but what is the new thing today? Well, a user going by the name of Cryptonator1337 uh, noticed that when you were in the Brave browser and typed in Binance.us or Binance.com or other variants in the, um, the search field, uh, in the latest version of the Brave browser, you would be redirected to an affiliate type looking link. And so he said, I am one of the last people who has something against referral links, but this seems a bit cringe when you think about Brave's mission, which is supposedly about improving user autonomy and privacy. And uh, he was absolutely not wrong. Um, a bunch of other people had the same thing happen when they tested it out themselves. Uh, and then a few people pointed to the actual code in the Brave browser code repo. And it was actually worse because that was not the only affiliate link there. Um, the affiliate link hijacks were included for Binance, Coinbase, Trezor, and Ledger. Um, and at this time, it's not clear whether Binance, Coinbase, Trezor, or Ledger know about this. I'm not going to insinuate that they do or had anything to do with this because we don't know. But it would be important to point it out to them because, uh, as Luke Childs uh, pointed out, um, or he asked, are the referral uh, partners aware that you've been abusing their referral programs to profit from users who were already intending to visit those URLs? Uh, which is entirely right, because if someone is already going to visit a website of their own volition, you inserting a referral link in there is kind of cheating because you didn't actually contribute to them being nudged to go there, which is the whole point of rewarding people for referrals is that they wouldn't have gone there otherwise. 
So that's a bit awkward, but anyway, um, someone else by the name of Kafer, who was talking to Cryptonator, um, looked a bit more closely at what was actually happening uh, and what was causing this and said that you need to, um, for most people, you need to manually deselect the autocomplete to avoid the referral link. So the referral link comes up as an autocomplete for a link that you're entering into the search bar, it, like you you would be typing out Binance and it would suggest an autocomplete that is a referral link. Um, so he said, if you type Binance, the focus automatically shifts on the autocompleted referral link version. As the referral link is longer than just Binance.us or .com, it remains there unless you either put something that deviates from the referral link or press cursor up once. So you basically have to, you have to do an action to make sure that you're not you're not auto-completing it by accident. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, this behavior is called link hijacking, um, or in, in a slightly different way, malicious redirects. And it is where the link that you thought you were going to is somehow replaced without your knowledge or permission by a different link, um, whether it's to a different page on the same website or a completely different website. And this is the first instance where I've seen this happening in a browser, at least under normal conditions. Um, it's probably happened in Chrome, but this is the first time I've actually seen it happen for myself in a browser. Um, usually this is something that is done by individual sites, not, not the browser itself. Um, it's especially done for obviously affiliate marketing purposes. It's very questionable security wise. I really, 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 really hate short links. Um, even though short links are used for things that are not affiliate marketing related, it's just to provide a shorter link that's easier to type out. But I really, really, really hate them because there has been a number of cases where attackers have attempted to hide redirects, um, bad malicious links behind ostens ostensibly normal looking links. And that results in the user accidentally downloading malware. Happens very frequently. So I noticed this a few hours ago and Brendan Ike replied to the thread and said, yes, we partner with Binance as an affiliate. That code identifies us, not you. I.e. he didn't think that this was a problem. And so then he replies to another person that yes, he thinks it is ethical, or at least doesn't see why it would be unethical, because, quote, it is similar to when you search in Firefox, Opera, or Safari, and a client ID query parameter is added. Now, it may be the case that they used a similar mechanism to that in order to do this whole autocomplete shit fuckery, but uh, no, it is not equivalent, because those parameters don't actually change the website or page that you go to usually. It mostly just changes how the page is formatted for you based on the browser or operating system that you're using. Um, so that, uh, just so that the page works and isn't broken. So it's not the same thing. That's like an optimization kind of thing, whereas this is um, making money off of switching links in a very weird, <laughs> uh, unethical way. Um, so I replied to Brendan and simply said, uh, hey, malicious redirects are a thing. You should not be training users to accept link hijacks as normal. And he agreed. and apparently has since put out a statement saying that Brave was wrong to be doing this. Uh, he said, we made a mistake, we're correcting. Brave default auto completes verbatim Binance.us in the address bar to add an affiliate code. We are a Binance affiliate. We refer users via the opt-in trading widget to uh, the new tab, but autocomplete should not add any code. Thanks to Ari Orange, J9, me. Um, he actually left out the person who originally tweeted about it, Crypto Nader. Um, but anyway, uh, he thanked people for crucial feedback. Um, he says that the default autocomplete for a domain should not add anything, uh, as in it was, it does do that, but it is wrong for them to do that. Redirect, even if private client side, apart from HTTPS everywhere, uh, type pure wins has the risk of conditioning users to be blind to bad server redirects, which is true. Um, but I am 
going to hold off on celebrating this as a small win until I check that they've actually removed the referral links. I haven't checked yet, but hopefully they will do that soon. Um, but I just wanted to bring this up because you should be aware that this is not acceptable behavior from a browser. Um, and if they do not remove them, I will continue to make it a problem for them. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that I guess when people at least pretend to listen to me, that is a good sign. Yeah. You know, I just want to say, you know, why is it that Brent and I keeps doing the scummiest, most unethical things to try to monetize his users. And then he magically sees the light when he gets called out over and over again by the same person. Like, um, I don't give a shit if he fucking rolls this back at this point because this is a long-standing pattern of just scummy, unethical behavior. And it doesn't matter if he rolls this back. He's going to do it again. Yeah, and I mean, you know, whatever. They want to monetize their browser. They could have still done this kind of thing in a much more clear and transparent way like a number of people thought why don't you just add the affiliate links to the home page and say hey would you like to support brave um, if you're going to use binance click on this link because i mean that's actually a requirement uh from some people i don't know if it's like an established standard it should be um if it isn't because that just makes sense you should disclose the fact that you know, this is a referral link and you're going to this website and nothing weird is happening. And that would also um, eliminate the problem of them kind of committing ad fraud, which is hilarious because one of the selling points of the Brave browser was that there's so much ad fraud and it's bad for the users and it's bad for the advertisers and we don't want to do ad fraud. And this is, um, this is ad fraud because you know, it's one thing if you have it on the home page, that means that when a user opens the browser, they may or may not be intending to go to Binance, but they see the link and maybe they decide to go. But if they're already typing it, you're you're cheating there. And that is uh that's that's not going to go down well. Um I would really be interested to know whether um any of the affiliates uh knew that this was going on because that might have consequences. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Want to get through the last blood pressure increasing story today? Yeah, so this is going to be a long scrolly one because this story ended up being bigger than I thought it was this morning, uh, but much more interesting. Uh, so in episode 221, um, I covered the recent data breach at BlockFi, which was allegedly perpetrated through a SIM swapping attack on one of their employees. And I also went into the possibility that they haven't been transparent enough and um, about the information that was gathered and how it's possible that phone numbers were also included in the data breach. That has been a rumor. And um, if that was the case, then BlockFi's customers um, could become victims of the SIM swap attacks themselves, which would fit and explain why BlockFi, in its recommendations for, for customers, was very heavy on the enable 2FA thing. It would explain why, because otherwise it makes no sense to recommend 2FA to customers when it was an employee who was doing the thing wrong. Um, but there are no updates on the block five front. I just want to bring it up again because they are still not talking very much. Um, but there was a data breach at another exchange and it really drives home how companies in this space are not taking the threat of using SMS to a seriously enough and also being very bad at data breach disclosure. Um, so on June 2nd, I believe that was Tuesday this week, Joseph Cox published Hackers Plan to Use Stolen Cryptocurrency Exchange Data for SIM Swapping. 
And the article says, hackers who obtained personal information on users of Canadian cryptocurrency exchange CoinSquare say that they plan to use the information to perform so-called SIM swapping attacks, according to one of the hackers. The breach signals the continued risk of insider access, with CoinSquare telling Motherboard that a former employee was responsible for stealing the data. Again, blame the employee. Who knows if that's true or if the employees are just scapegoats. Um, the original intent was to sell it, uh, the data, but we figured out that we would make more money by SIM swapping the accounts, a pseudonymous hacker who provided the CoinSquare data to Motherboard said in an online chat. CoinSquare lets users buy and sell Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other cryptocurrencies. On its website, it describes itself as the most secure thing platform. The hacker added, I set out to embarrass the company for claiming that they were the most secure Canadian exchange. And obviously that is a lie. I can't say that I'd agree. Uh, burn. But it's also true that uh, pretty much every exchange claims to be the most secure, the best in class, and it's all bullshit because they have no objective standard by which they compare themselves to when they make those claims. Um, so furthermore, in the article, the hacker provided Motherboard with a version of the data stolen from CoinSquare. It includes just over 5,000 rows um, of users' email addresses, phone numbers, and in some cases, physical addresses. The data also contains a column titled Total Money Funded for Six Months, which could represent the dollar amount put in a user's CoinSquare account in that period, and whether CoinSquare marks that user as a high-value client. That is not something that you want to be targeted for, people. Um, and apparently the data, luckily, despite everything, does not include passwords. Um, or does not appear to. Motherboard verified the data by attempting to make accounts on CoinSquare with a random selection of email addresses in the data. This was not possible because the addresses were already linked to CoinSquare accounts, strongly suggesting that the data does not relate to CoinSquare user or does relate to CoinSquare users. So yeah, that's something that people have also done with Twitter um, because when you try to do like a password reset or something, uh, sometimes it will it will reveal a portion of an email address and you can also try to open accounts without actually opening account on various services and sometimes the service will tell you this email address is already in use and that basically confirms that it's been used for an account. Um, so not a compromise but certainly a good way of confirming whether it's a legitimate data breach. Um, so several of the tested addresses were also not publicly available via Google searches suggesting that this is, a lar this is largely private information. Motherboard also contacted a number of people listed in the database Three responded, confirming they are CoinSquare users, and two confirmed their phone numbers. Imagine that. A random journalist is providing better customer experience than you do, CoinSquare. Um, CoinSquare said that the data came uh, not from a hacker uh, of its systems, but rather a former employee who stole the information. The data was obtained as a result of employee theft of information contained within a client relationship database used for prospecting. Okay, Stacy Hoysack, Coinbase's general counsel, told Motherboard in an email. Okay, that's that's not weird. Uh, Hoysack added that the company became aware of the issue about a year ago and notified law enforcement, data protection authorities, and all known impacted users at the time. She suggested the company was not originally aware of the full extent of the breach but you were aware of the breach. <laughs> However, after Motherboard provided a limited set of screenshots of data to CoinSquare so that they could provide an informed statement, uh, Hoysik characterized some of the information as additional usernames. That's keyword for, oh, we didn't previously know that those were compromised. Thank you for telling us. Um, what I do find interesting com in comparison to the the BlockFi data breach is that if you look at the document, the incident report that they released, the report is not signed by a specific team member. I don't remember seeing a name. It's just the BlockFi team, something like that. There's no, there's no job title. There's no name. Uh, what was interesting about the incident report that I will get to in a bit is that they actually, I'm pretty sure they not only had 
uh, the job title of legal counsel, but also a, a like data protection officer. Whether they actually have those two positions, I don't know because I don't think they actually showed their names. I'm not sure. But I do find it interesting that, at least in this case, they knew that people would expect to see that, and so they listed it, whereas BlockFi apparently didn't go to the effort at all. Uh, one second while I scroll. Um, so, continued in the article, since we were made aware of this issue last year, CoinSquare has replaced internal sales management systems, rewritten data management policy, and upgraded its internal controls, and we are not aware of any breach or additional employee thefts since that time, she continued. Um, so that's the end of the article. Now, um, given the situation with BlockFi, I thought it would be worthwhile to see uh, whether CoinSquare had made any kind of announcement or drew attention to this, this critical issue at any time whatsoever. And so I go over to their Twitter account, CoinSquare, at, at CoinSquare, and there's nothing. I mean, there may be something now because I kind of stirred up some shit, but when I checked, there was nothing. And uh, their last tweet was May 25th. Um, in the past, they have tweeted about other exchanges' data breaches, other exchanges' hacks, but oh no, no nothing, nothing about their own. Uh, no announcement on their website. Um, and in fact, their, their latest blog post uh, is from March 11th, CoinSquare engaging with Canadian regulators. There's no mention of a precise date in any of their posts, even the, the latest one about when the data breach actually occurred. They just give this rough estimate that it was kind of over a year ago. Um, and the blog post that they published on August 2019, which, you know, that's, that's, that was, could have been roughly a year ago. Um, not quite over a year though, so probably a bit. <laughs> A bit late on that one, but that was titled How to Increase Your CoinSquare Account Security with Two-Factor Authentication. Isn't that interesting how when a data breach happens, one of the uh, first posts that seems to go up is uh, what users should do, not, hey, we've done this thing wrong. Um, and what was also weird is that their website doesn't list anyone who runs or works for the exchange, not a single person, which I find weird because it's this whole, you know, thing about them being a trusted third party and it's like, how how do you trust the party when you don't even know who they are? No idea. Um, so I, I did a thing and I searched for CoinSquare CEO uh, and results came up and it seems to me that it's some dude, the CEO is some dude named Cole Diamond. Great name. Oh, what's this? CoinSquare CEO response to data breach posted yesterday on a subreddit uh, for Canadian Bitcoiners. Oh no, don't tell me that they're publicly disclosing a year-old data breach through an obscure Canadian subreddit. Yes, they did. They did. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's very blah, blah, blah. But you should know uh, that the most important thing is the affected persons. Uh, it Quote, the facts of those infected uh, impacted. 286,000 users had no information leaked. 3,653 CoinSquare users did have some form of personally identifiable information, PII, leaked because the information comes from the CRM tool. Um, there is inconsistently inconsistency in the data by each user. The information ranges from just names, emails, and phone numbers to, in very few cases, there is an address. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier in the uh, main chat, but they should have been a lot more clear about what they mean by addresses, because that could mean cryptocurrency addresses or it could mean postal addresses. And thankfully, when BlockFi talked about this, they specifically said postal addresses, so there was no ambiguity. But at the moment, I seriously do not know whether they're talking about cryptocurrency addresses or they're talking about postal addresses, because one is more severe than the other. Um, but they say, they claim that only nine addresses were impacted, whatever that means. Then there's a further 1,346 non-CoinSquare users that had some information leaked. Wow, that, that sucks. You don't even have to be a user to get burned. Um, again, this confirms to us, in addition to the layout of the data and the column headings, that this information is from a CRM tool. Uh, we promise to do a better job communicating with you on a forward basis. Thank you, Cold Diamond, CEO of CoinSquare. Insert Persian cat room guardian meme. 
Yeah. Um, everybody who uses that company should immediately close their account and withdraw all money from that. And like, yeah, I don't say this often. Um, anybody affected by this breach should sue them. Like that is insane. People's information was fucking compromised and just nothing, not a peep for over a year until it, it's like they're they're about to get called out anyway so now they disclose it like get the fuck out of here like if if you use coinsquare close your account and don't look back and if you were affected by this you really should consider suing them yeah it's like i said it's amazing that um that a journalist did a better job of customer support than than this exchange and unfortunately it might have been too late because the motherboard article that prompted this response uh it's amazing how fast companies work when people know things all of a sudden um the the motherboard article that prompted this basically said uh if it's true there was a person claiming they were going to use this information for the sim swapping um now in their response, they said that in the last week they've been reaching out to customers and apparently telling them how to prevent attacks, um, most likely SIM swaps. But uh, well, let's just hope it's not too little too late. Mm -hmm. Companies like that should just be left in the dust, plain and simple. Alrighty. So are we Which... ready for a crazy story and then uh, and then some questions? Yeah, which which other company needs to be left in the dust? Okay, so when you thought the Bitmain story couldn't get any fucking crazier, McCree Zan on June fourth literally stormed, not guns blazing or anything but stormed into the bitmain headquarters of beijing with a private security team and took over the building and so um yeah the the last time this story was brought up um i mentioned the notice from the bitmain board of investors claiming that mccree zan had no legal connection to the companies anymore and pretty much said, I have no clue what the fuck is going on anymore. Um, well, according to Wolfie Zhao, um, like one of the only people still writing for Coindesk that has any degree of competence, um, effectively what happened is McCree was removed and then actually did get legal control of the company back. Um but effectively what happened is he had to um, pretty much get a new, I guess you would call it the equivalent of a business license, but um, Wolfie is referring to it as a business seal. Um, and that letter um, put out that we covered last time claiming that McCree had no legal connections to Bitmain before um, was using the original company seal um, that McCree had voided. Um, and so pretty much, um, yeah, it, it looks based on everything that, that Wolfie's reported here that McCree actually is the legal representative of the company. Um, and he literally had to storm the headquarters with a private security team and is now trying to offer cash bonuses um, for anybody returning to the office um, because most people have been working remotely um, during the pandemic and lockdown. Um, and there are currently attempts from, I guess, Jihan's faction of the company to start shuffling employees and assets to a subsidiary um, registered under another subsidiary incorporated in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, <laughs> so th this is a uh, this is going to get pretty crazy, and um, I'm betting where this goes at this point with uh, the clarification from Wolfie as far as the, the legal legitimacy of involvement with the company, um, that this is going to lead to a straight-up fracturing of Bitmain, 
And I can't see how that happens without a massive legal fight over who owns what intellectual property. So, um, yeah, uh, this little bit of clarification now, I mean, I, Bitmain is fucked. Like, if that's where this keeps going, like, they are going to drag themselves into the dirt, suing themselves into oblivion. And I can't really think of a more fitting way for Bitmain to just collapse on itself. <laughs> Alrighty. And I guess, um, this last one is very light on details. Um, but in the, the last, uh, rabbit hole recap with Marty Bent and Matt Odell, um, they commented on the fact that shift crypto, um, is actually declared bankruptcy, um, on May 14th. And they issued yesterday, um, a correction claiming that uh, they have been informed, I'm assuming somebody from Shift, that it was simply a restructuring of their business. But you can follow the links in the show notes. Um, no, this was bankruptcy. They actually declared for bankruptcy and had the, the corporation dissolved. So... Yeah, we need answers to that because a simple restructuring of a company um, does not involve bankruptcy proceedings without some massive fuck up going on internally. Um, you know, you, you generally declare bankruptcy when you don't have money anymore, um, not to just restructure a business. There are a million ways to restructure a business that don't involve bankruptcy. Um, so frankly, whoever reached out to Matt and tried to pressure him into that statement, um, get the fuck out of here. All of your customers deserve clear answers without the bullshit because a simple restructuring is not what a bankruptcy is. But on that note, I am kind of exhausted because I woke up at like six in the morning today and I'm getting kind of hungry. So uh, what do we got in ways of final thoughts today, Janine? I am hungry as well. Um, someone who is also hungry and deserves to be fed is uh, Sci-Hub. And I don't know if something happened recently that triggered some people to talk about this, but um they, they don't tweet very often, the Sci-Hub Twitter account. Um, it's run, Sci-Hub is run by a Kazakh woman. And she tweeted yesterday about um, helping people figure out how to donate Bitcoin to Sci-Hub. Um, and I knew that Sci-Hub accepted Bitcoin, but what I didn't, well, I should have guessed. But if you don't know what Sci-Hub is, it's basically a portal to be able to access um, academic papers and research that is either paywalled or very difficult to access from certain parts of the world for whatever reason. And like I've used it a few times and it is amazing, even for papers that are publicly available their search interface for just finding papers even if even if they're freely out there and there's no problem accessing them it's a really great interface for just being able to find papers very quickly um and so uh they tweeted recently about you know how to donate bitcoin and unfortunately because uh apparently this is a you know, with copyright and everything, they've been fighting a few legal battles over the past couple of years to be basically be able to exist. They're they're kind of they're almost up there with WikiLeaks in terms of the number of people and institutions that want to take them down, like Elsevier, uh, which uh, was very influential on what happened to Aaron Schwartz, to say the least. And um, but what many people probably don't know is that you know basically despite, you know, just making documents accessible to people who might have a hard time accessing them. Um, there's a lot of payment uh, systems that don't uh, let her use uh, any, 
any of their stuff to accept donations. And so she basically exclusively has to use Bitcoin in order to get donations. Um, so she pointed out that PayPal doesn't work. And so cool because she was uh, telling people to go to local Bitcoins, which, you know, based on what we talked about is questionable. But some other people were suggesting using PayNIMS and also updating the donation Bitcoin address to at least a SegWit one, which she hadn't done yet. But yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out if you haven't, because it's really great work. Um, and it's really cool that this is another example of a project that might not be able to continue to exist without Bitcoin, because all of the other methods of just paying people on the internet are fucked. Yeah, and I guess I just want to you know, make a quick reiteration about what I said in the last episode regarding all of this going on right now with these protests, with what's going on in the U.S. and now spreading to whole different parts of the world. Uh, keep your head about you. Um, make sure that you are not just blindly um, – just following something that you saw as true and reacting to it without any kind of verification because that doesn't do any good to help the situation. You know, we have police brutality problems in this country. We have problems with racism, but you solve those by talking about them and actually thinking about them. Um, not shaving your head and making yourself look like a white neo-Nazi in supposed solidarity with black people. Because newsflash, that was 4chan memeing you. And if you did that, um, you not only look really stupid, you should feel real stupid too. Because you just got tricked into making yourself look like a neo-Nazi by trolls on the internet. Use your heads, everybody. Like, yes, we have problems in this country. Talk about them. Find solutions. Because losing your mind isn't going to solve anything. And on that note, catch you later, punks. Bye. Yeah, you have to